ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the Institute of International European Affairs, I'd like to welcome you to what the Institute is calling an, an armchair style discussion with Ambassador Bill Burns. My name is David Donoghue. I'm a retired Irish diplomat. Uh, our topic is America's role in the post-pandemic world, but I imagine that we will range far and wide across the landscape of US foreign policy past and present. And there's no better interlocutor and authority on this than Ambassador William Burns. Bill is president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, has been there since he retired from the US Foreign Service in 2014. And in the course of, uh, uh, I can fairly say, an illustrious 30-year career as a professional diplomat, he held uh, critically important posts abroad and at home, those abroad including Ambassador to Jordan, 1998 to 2001, Ambassador to the Russian Federation from 2005 to 8. He also held top posts in the State Department, including that of Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs from 2001 to 5 in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. Uh, he was also Under Secretary for Political Affairs from 2008 to uh, 11, and he was uh, Deputy Secretary of State under Hillary Clinton. He was only the second career diplomat in US history to attain the post of Deputy Secretary of State, a sign of the remarkable uh, prestige which he enjoyed really throughout his career. Um, and uh, uh, it is therefore a, a very great pleasure that we have Bill with us today. Um, he has, as it happens, Irish roots on both his father and his mother's side, um, and indeed his wife Lisa also has Irish roots. So in a sense, we are uh, welcoming one of our own, uh, as well as a foremost um, uh, authority on US foreign policy. Our conversation uh, follows the usual IIEA format. Uh, it will last for some 25 minutes and will be followed by a question and answer session from the audience. You're all warmly invited to send in questions, and in the time available, we'll, we'll try to pass as many as possible to Bill. Before beginning, let me confirm that this conversation and the Q&A session will be on the record. Bill, you're very, very welcome. Um, we haven't literally got the armchair, but hopefully we can make up for that and on some future occasion. Last year, you published a, a masterly account of your career under the title, The Back Channel. Uh, it, it has been very warmly received, including in Ireland. In a sense, it's an assessment of American diplomacy over the past 40 years, at the highs and the lows, the, the, the successes, the mistakes, um, but as much as a record of your own career. So to, to kick off our conversation, Bill, could you, could you say really, could you address the point, does, why did you decide to write it? What moved you to, to write the back channel. Well, Dave, first, it's it's wonderful to be with you today and to be with um, all of everyone in the audience as well. Um, we recovering diplomats need to stick together. <laughs> so it's a, it's a pleasure to have the chance to talk with you, even if only virtually this time. Um, I wrote the book, The Back Channel, I think, for two reasons. First, as a memoir, and second, as an argument. Uh, the memoir part is pretty straightforward. What I was trying to do is um, enliven diplomacy for a wider audience. Um, diplomacy, as you well know, may be one of the world's oldest professions, but also one of the most misunderstood. It does oftentimes operate in back channels, out of sight and out of mind. And I was very fortunate over three and a half decades as a professional diplomat to play a modest role in some of the most significant events in American foreign policy as the Cold War was ending, and then in the you know quarter century or so after the end of the Cold War, um, from you know working in the first Bush administration for Secretary of State James Baker, from whom I learned a great deal, of a very fine diplomat, through Russia's evolution from Boris Yeltsin's Russia when it was flat on its back after the end of the Cold War, to a much different Russia under Vladimir Putin for most of the last 20 years, Putin's particularly pugnacious combination of ambition and grievance and insecurity. And then, as you mentioned, spent a lot of time, uh, for better or worse, on Middle East issues um, from high points, such as um, I think the coalition that President Bush Sr., as well as Baker and others, organized to expel Iraq from Kuwait 
um, in the early 1990s, the Madrid Peace Conference that uh, Baker masterfully put together, which created a very rare moment of hope on the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Um, and then some you know, much more somber moments, the tragic mistake we made in the war in Iraq in 2003, the turbulence of the Arab Spring some years later, I led the secret talks with the Iranians on the nuclear issue through all of 2013 and beyond and helped create the framework for the comprehensive nuclear deal that's sadly receding into history now. Um, and then, especially in the last decade or so of my career, spent a lot of time focused on the rise of Asia, China's rise, U.S. relations with India, a range of other issues, as well as you know, the great overarching global challenges of our time, whether it's climate change or global health and security, which we've been painfully reminded mm -hmm. of um, in recent months as well. So, you know, I tried to be honest in the memoir part. There's always a, um, a temptation to write what you wish you had said as opposed mm -hmm. to what you really did. So I tried to anchor this in uh, declassified documents as well. So you could see warts and all, um, things that I got mostly right and things that I got wrong as well over the years. The argument, just to add one last brief point, is also quite straightforward. And it, it is that over those three and a half decades as a professional American diplomat, I've never seen a moment today when diplomacy mattered more to the pursuit of American interests and the values we share with so many other countries, especially across the Atlantic. Um, and not only mattered more, but been more adrift. You know, a moment when in both tangible and intangible ways, uh, my old institution, the State Department, and the institution of American diplomacy is being hollowed out, which I think um, carries with it real risks um, <clears throat> for the way in which America conducts itself in the world. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it, it, it's obvious to all of us that U.S. diplomacy is a, a, a drift. That's, one, that's a good way of describing it. A drift, certainly, in the last few years. Um, uh, but, I mean, does diplomacy itself, as an instrument of international relations, does it still or can it still command public support, do you think? I mean, it's an, it's an issue that we... Uh, ask ourselves, or a question we ask ourselves here as well. We are fortunate in Ireland in that there has been um, generally a, a strong volume of public support for diplomacy, but we're a small and fairly uh, uh, uniform sort of nation, um, uh, and, and maybe the, the immediate dividends of, diplomacy, of Irish diplomacy are more visible, and we were fortunate that we were recently elected to the Security Council, so that gave a good example of a tangible outcome, but it is vastly more complicated and difficult to explain, I presume, to an American public what are the, the net dividends of, of, um, uh, of diplomacy. So could you elaborate a little? I mean, in your book, sure. you, you go into that and it's fascinating, but it would be very interesting to, to hear your thoughts uh, in this conversation. Of course. Well, first, congratulations on Ireland's um, election um, to the Security Council as well. I know how complicated that process is, and no one knows it better than you do. <clears throat> so it's an exciting time, I think, for Irish diplomacy. Um, I guess what I would say is we have to be honest with ourselves in the United States. There is today uh, a significant and growing disconnect between people like me, you know, card-carrying members of the Washington establishment, and lots of American citizens who, when we preach the virtues of disciplined American leadership in the world, don't, in my experience anyway, generally need to be persuaded of the significance of American engagement in the world outside our borders. But they're a lot more skeptical about the disciplined part because they've seen too many instances, especially in the last 20 years, of you know, administrations of both parties not matching ends to means um, of overreaching, of making some pretty significant mistakes. I mentioned Iraq in 2003, but you know, I think the global financial crisis a few years later was a, a reflection of a different kind of hubris. So there's a huge task ahead. Um, you have to recognize that Donald Trump didn't invent that disconnect in American society. He's taken advantage of it and, in a sense, ridden a lot of those passions with his argument that you know, American power in the world is best served unilaterally, that allies and coalitions and partners are sort of like Gulliver and the Lilliputians, you know, that American power is tied down 
by allies and partners and international institutions, and that the best way to exercise it is to throw off those bonds as well. I, I, I think that is precisely the wrong prescription for a moment on the international landscape when the United States is no longer the only big kid on the geopolitical block. I would argue, and I don't mean this as a statement of American arrogance, that we still have a better hand to play than any of our major rivals. Of course, that's in part because of our military and economic leverage, but it's also because of our capacity to invest in alliances, draw on coalitions of countries, mobilize other countries to deal with those great overarching challenges, whether it's climate or pandemics, or the revo revolution in technology. Um, and that's really the challenge of leadership, is to help demonstrate to that skeptical American public, which is reeling right now from the pandemic itself and its economic consequences, to demonstrate that while we always tell ourselves that smart foreign policy begins at home in a mm -hmm. strong political and economic system, um, Washington has to do a much better job of reminding people that smart foreign policy ends at home too in more economic opportunities and a healthier environment and more security um, as we try to create a more inclusive form of economic growth in the United States amidst all the problems we face today of economic inequalities, of systemic racism, many of which have been accelerated and exposed um, during the COVID pandemic as well. So the first step, I think, is to be honest about how big that disconnect is in our own society. There is a natural, in some ways, impulse on the part of a lot of Americans to pull back from the world today and to focus on what many people call the challenge of nation building at home. And it's the test of leadership, I think, to demonstrate to people that, the, that, that domestic renewal can be served effectively by a smart, disciplined foreign policy that helps create economic opportunities on the international landscape for the United States that significantly reforms our immigration policy that so we're once again a more open society than we've been before so that we can take advantage of our technological innovativeness and so that we can work with others on those big challenges like climate change that no one country however powerful they may be can solve on its own yeah absolutely um i mean you raise a number of, of, of very important points there bill uh, i mean the, the there's no doubt that um, one can sense that the american public is is retreating from uh, the automatic acceptance of an American kind of global policeman role. And it has been happening for a number of years, but Donald Trump, as you say, has has uh, sort of brought it to a, to a new level or he has exploited it um, fairly, fairly bluntly. But none of us know what will happen in November. Could, can you foresee a situation in which the next administration, if it is led by Joe Biden, uh, whether it would be in a, be able to retrieve some of that lost ground or do we need to think and you hinted this in your book do we need to think that in fact we've moved on to a third position where the u.s will never again play that dominant role that we traditionally expect for, but where it is one of a number admittedly it's a pivotal one but it is one of a number of of major powers jostling for position i mean how do you think things could go from november if i can put it like that I'm, I'm by nature an optimist. Um, you, you know, I'm a believer in what Alexis de Tocqueville, the famous French observer of American life, said, you know, more than a century and a half ago that the truly exceptional quality of Americans is their capacity for self repair. I never thought we'd put that capacity to as serious a test as we've done in the last four years, but I, I still think that we retain that quality. But we have to be honest that. It's not as if the rest of the world has waited for us to get our act together. The international landscape is shifting in some significant ways. I think we have entered into, as you well know, Dave, um, one of the most complicated periods in international order, and that is a period of transition from the old post-Cold War order, marked by singular American dominance, um, into a transition with the, the new order uh, you know, only dimly visible on the road ahead. And I think it's going to be marked by at least three features. One is major shifts in the balance of power among states, especially with the rise of China. As I argued before, I still think the United States has a relatively better hand to play than anyone else if we play it with discipline and play it effectively. 
Um, second is, you know, as we discussed before, um, those major transformations and challenges that go beyond the reach of any one state, climate, global health, um, the revolution in technology. And third are major uncertainties about the role of the United States, my own country, you know, the main driver of the post-Cold War international order, now seen by too many people around the world as having a president who's drunk at the wheel. Mm. Now the notion, the notion <clears throat> that we can protect our interests, further our interests um, by um, a rapid rush to retrenchment, I think is a mistake. I think it's equally illusory to think that restoration of that period of American dominance is possible, that you can just click a switch with the election of a new administration and restore the world as Americans saw it, you know, a decade ago or two decades ago. That's not possible either. What is possible, and this is the optimist in me, um, is to reinvent, I think, um, the way in which Americans look at the world, to recognize that we magnify, we multiply our influence by working with allies and partners, by reforming, helping to reform international institutions, as you know from your own experience, many of them desperately in need of serious reform, but to actively engage in those issues um, in a way that you know we haven't in recent years. So it's it's that task of reinvention, I think, which is the main one, you know, before any new administration and and for several administrations to come. But the damage has been quite corrosive in recent years, as I said, not just to my old institution, the State Department, where you've seen a systematic sidelining of career expertise, a pernicious practice of going after individual career diplomats, as we saw during the Ukraine impeachment saga, simply because they were doing their jobs and upholding their oaths to the Constitution. And then there are the intangible factors. You know, when President Trump was asked a couple of years ago whether he was worried about all the vacancies at senior levels in the State Department, he said, not really, because I'm the only one who matters. Well, that's diplomacy as an exercise in narcissism, not the diplomacy I learned many years ago from people like Secretary of State Baker. Absolutely. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned a couple of times uh, alliances, and um, uh, for, from a European perspective, it's, it has been disconcerting to see how Trump has basically uh, close down one alliance or partnership in Europe uh, after another and um, uh, well with, with the possible exception of our nearest neighbor but um, uh, I mean there would be a lot of ground to make up there's no doubt that for the for the next let's assume it's a uh, it's it, it's not a Trump-led administration um, it, it is difficult to see that there can be an overnight change in in, in uh, the attitude in, in, in US attitudes towards and I, I, I sincerely hope there will be, but um, in a way we, we've seen a, an erosion over the last four years and, and um, there's a, the, the, there is a, um, a lot of dismay, I think, at the way in which American leadership has, has retreated. So again, I suppose one has to rely on uh, your optimism, Bill, that, that we will get back to something resembling that. Um, I, I, I was myself an ambassador to Germany for a few years and, and others know Germany well and I, I am particularly dismayed at how that relationship, uh, which has stood the test of time really, that that, that, that relationship has been left with around the vine. But let's turn perhaps to um, uh, other, to some areas of the world in, in slightly more detail. I mean, you're, you're a great Russia expert, um, uh, you were there on several occasions. And in a way, Putin, as you say in your book, is one of the big disruptors. I mean, Russia itself may be a declining power, but um, it is capable of, of, of causing a lot of trouble. How, I mean, you've seen uh, Russia in the, in the 90s, the early 90s. You were then ambassador in 2005 to 8, I think. Um, how do you see uh, Russia right now? I mean, at one level, Putin's power is, in fact, uh, his internal power should be diminishing because of the state of the economy uh, and lo lower energy prices. But do you think he has the capacity to retain his leverage within Russia until 2035, as I think he has in mind? 
Yeah, well, most of my gray hair, I think, came from my service in Russia in the 90s and then as ambassador a little more than a decade ago. And it, it's certainly a country that you know very well, Dave. Um, I guess I would say the following. Well let, well, let me start with a story. I remember vividly my first meeting with Vladimir Putin as the newly arrived U.S. ambassador in Moscow. And you remember this very well. The meeting took place in the Kremlin, which is built on a scale that's meant to intimidate visitors, especially newly arrived American ambassadors. So as you recall very well, you walk down these very long corridors through huge ornate halls. You come to the end of one huge ornate hall, and there are these two-story bronze doors. You're kept waiting in front of the doors for a few minutes just to let all this sink in. Then the door cracks open a little bit and out comes Vladimir Putin, the president of the Russian Federation. Now, you know, Putin, despite his bare-chested persona, is not all that intimidating in the flesh. He's yes. about five foot six, even with lifts in his shoes. <laughs> but he carries himself with great self-assurance. So he comes walking through the doors. And before I got a word out of my mouth, says in Russian, you Americans need to listen more. You can't have everything your own way anymore. We can have effective relations, but not just on your terms. Mm. In my experience, that was vintage Vladimir Putin. It was not subtle. It was almost defiantly charmless, um, but it carried with it a very clear message. And, you know, I think Putin, in his worldview in recent years, as he looks at the United States, sees two purposes. One is that the best way to create space for Russia as a major power on the international landscape, um, you know, even, even as it's uh, declining, as you mentioned before, um, is uh, to chip away at an American-led order. And second, I think, which is convenient for a very repressive regime at home, is to be able to point to an enemies at the gate. The United States in particular, in Putin's worldview, determined to keep Russia down and try to undermine um, his regime as well. So where does that leave us? In U.S.-Russian relations, I think we're going to be operating um, no matter who's selected in Washington and the United States in November, within a pretty narrow band of possibilities, um, from the sharply competitive to the nastily adversarial. But I would add that even in that uh, difficult kind of a major power relationship, you need to preserve guardrails, um, like the New START agreement, which is about to expire in just a few months but which reduces, regulates, verifies, and monitors the strategic nuclear arsenals of both the United States um, and Russia. And I think it's critically important, notwithstanding um, my sober view of what's possible in U.S.-Russia relations, especially in Putin's time, um, to try to preserve and sustain those guardrails as well. Yes. Um, by the way, you have a wonderful anecdote in your book about um, uh, Putin sort of Affecting a kind of tsar-like grandeur uh, when you had some, uh, when you and I think, was it Condi Rice uh, arrived on a visit uh, and again there's one upmanship. Um, and there were, they reminded me of a one upmanship uh, anecdote about Hillary Clinton, I think. And she also, if you're probably not in your time, but where she um, uh, was summoned to a birthday party that he was holding out in the in, in the Serbini Boar, I think, outside Moscow. Uh, and uh, again, it was Putin's deliberate attempt to wrong Fusher in various, uh, in various ways. Um, the, yeah, that, was with, that was with Gandhi Rice as well, the, the birthday the, party, yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, Bill, what do you make of the, of the particular hold which Putin appears to have uh, over Donald Trump? I mean, is it just two people, two leaders who have a strictly transactional approach? Are those hard to see what Trump is getting out of it, very hard to see what he's getting out of it. Um, but how do, you, how do you assess or explain the uh, strange uh, uh, mystique that Putin appears to hold for Trump? Yeah, it's a very good question. I, I'm not sure we've yet plumbed the depths of that relationship and what the, the, you know, the core of the transactionalism really is. Um, I think President Trump has a bad case of autocrat envy. Um, I think in his view of the world, um, you know, events should be shaped by big guys, and he does mean big guys because he's also a misogynist, I think. Um, and, and he envies in a lot of ways the way in which autocrats like Putin or Xi Jinping uh, manage to conduct their affairs. I think he also has a sense of insecurity about the perception on the part of many Americans, including 
the 17 U.S. law enforcement and intelligence agencies that Putin's Russia interfered in our election in 2016 in an effort to boost Trump's chances and undermine Hillary Clinton's as well. And so his insecurity about that issue, which you hear often in his public statements, um, you know, reflects a concern about the legitimacy of his election. I think you'll remember the scene on the stage in Helsinki in the summer of 2018, mm -hmm. Um, uh, when Putin and Trump were conducting a press conference after their summit meeting. And at one point, um, President Trump essentially threw those 17 intelligence and law enforcement agencies under the bus and said that in effect, he trusted Putin's word, who was denying that he interfered in our elections against the judgment of his own experts. And I, that was an effort apparently on his part to ingratiate himself with Putin. But I think if you could have seen the the thought bubble or the cartoon balloon coming out of Putin's head on that stage, it would have read, what an easy mark. Yeah. Because from his point of view, that attempt to ingratiate was a sign of weakness and manipulability. And I think, you know, in many ways, Donald Trump has been the gift that keeps on giving for authoritarian leaders around the world. They're adept, many of them, at manipulating leaders who try to ingratiate themselves with them. Absolutely. Then moving to China to, to, to briefly, um, I mean, what strategy do you think best serves U.S. interests with the present Chinese leadership? Trump has obviously gone for one of confrontation. One could also imagine that containment might, might have been more effective uh, or in some way coexistence. But what's your, what is your own recipe for U.S.-Chinese relations at the moment? I think competition between the United States and China, just to show you that recovering diplomats still have a capacity to restate the glaringly obvious, <laughs> that that competition is going to be the central geopolitical challenge as far out into the 21st century as I can see. And in a way, that's always the test of statecraft, is how do you manage that kind of intense competition so that it stops short of actual collisions? Um, and where you can pursue your interests, this is in the case of the United States, um, you know, in, in ways that don't run unnecessary risks. I think all of us in Washington over the last 30 or 40 years have probably been guilty of some lazy assumptions about the benefits of engagement with China. In other words, that as China modernized economically and grew economically, it was going to evolve into a more open political system, which has not turned out to be the case. But I think we need to be careful these days in Washington about a different kind of lazy assumptions. The lazy assumptions that we can somehow prevent China's rise um, or that we can decouple our economies entirely. And I think they're far too entangled for that. The challenge I think is not so much preventing China's rise, it's shaping the environment into which China rises. And there, coming back to my earlier point about allies and coalitions and rules, I think the United States today, notwithstanding all the damage that Donald Trump has done to our, our strategies, um, still retains a capacity across Asia from rising powers like India, all the way across to our traditional treaty allies in Japan and South Korea and Australia, um, to, to play a significant role in shaping the incentives and disincentives of the Chinese leadership. And I think what that's going to mean is much easier said than done. It's amazing how much smarter all of us get after we leave government service. But, um, you know, it's going to require, I think, diversifying supply chains so that in certain sensitive areas for national security, you know, whether it's in 5G technology or, you know, uh, an over-dependence on one particular link in a supply chain for pharmaceuticals and health products, as we've discovered during the pandemic, to diversify and make more durable uh, those supply chains. And this is not just true for the United States, but I think it's true for the European Union as well, um, without disrupting the wider swath of global supply chains, which benefit American consumers and which have enormous benefit for emerging markets and developing countries around the world who are about to be hit, I think, even harder um, by the pandemic in both human and, and economic terms as well. So managing that relationship is going to be enormously complicated. It's going to take a much more serious effort than we've seen in the Trump era to work with allies and partners, not just in Asia, but also in Europe. Again, not on the assumption that you're going to see identical 
EU policies toward China, but I think it is possible to achieve an approach to China across the Atlantic, um, which is complementary and consistent, and where we're able to coordinate a little more effectively on a lot of these big overarching issues. That's going to be a big challenge, I think, in transatlantic relations as well. I mean, just to add one last point, I, I've never taken issue with President Trump's effort to push back against predatory Chinese trade and investment practices. Where I've been critical is um, the way in which he's gone about doing that, um, to embark almost entirely unilaterally on a set of tariff conflicts, rather than make common cause with the European Union or with Japan, with other major players who share many of those same concerns. And instead, what we've done is started second and third front tariff conflicts with them as well. Bill, thank you very much for that. We, we might just cover two other issues very briefly and then uh, open up the, the Q&A session. Um, the Middle East, Bill, on the, in which you are also very, very, very well versed. We follow in Ireland, we follow developments uh, in the uh, Arab-Israeli uh, conflict and peace efforts with great interest. Um, it's a major priority for, for, for the Irish government. Um, Frankly, there has been dismay here at the plans for Israeli annexation of, of, of further Palestinian territory and, and the steady retreat on Washington's part from uh, a two-state settlement. What's your take on that? Is that something which we can regard as an aberration on the part of the, of the Trump administration, which may be overtaken by a future one? Or is there a sort of a uh, might might a future administration be a little bit more ambiguous? I'm just just trying to get a sense of how permanent is the shift in Washington's uh, 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 attitude on on a two state settlement. Well, I think the responsibility for the deep corrosion of the possibilities of a two state solution between Israelis and Palestinians can be widely shared over recent decades in U.S. administrations. I think the you know the so called um, you know, deal of the century that President Trump and his son-in-law have promoted um, is, um, is likely to bury a two-state solution. And in a sense, what we've done is indulge um, an Israeli government's interest in annexation in the West Bank and taking further unilateral steps, um, which really could be the last nail in the coffin of a two-state solution. I think that so-called deal of the century is based on a set of false assumptions. The false assumption first that you can make progress um, toward peace between Israelis and Palestinians and more widely between Arabs and Israelis by working over or around Palestinians. Second, the notion that um, you, know, you can substitute economic incentives for people's political dignity. If that were the case, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict would have been solved a long time ago. And third, I think the false assumption that time is on our side and the reality is that if you look at demographic changes moving inexorably in the land that Israel controls from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean, Arabs are gonna be in a majority, whether it's a decade from now or two decades from now in that area. And I don't see how you can sustain Israel as a Jewish democratic society, you know, given those demographic changes and when occupation begins to seem like a permanent condition as well. That's not in the interests of Palestinians, nor in my view, um, as someone who has supported the US-Israeli relationship for many years, is it in the interests of Israel and its long-term future as well. Not to mention, you know, the significant negative consequences for small but important neighboring countries like Jordan as well. Um, so, I'm, so I'm undecided on that issue. So I'm, I'm deeply okay. concerned, I think, about you know, the drift in things and what may, may be still to come. What, what may come. Um, Bill, at one point in your book, you um, uh, mentioned uh, that there is a case to be made for renewed Atlanticism. And we as, as Europeans, uh, and indeed as Europeans who in Ireland have strong affinities to the US, we would greatly welcome that. But do you, do you think that that will be a priority uh, of a future administration? I don't mean to suggest that you in any yeah. way are... <laughs> or can be a spokesman for no. an, an administration that hasn't yet happened. Um, but we, I think, on this side of the Atlantic would, would sincerely hope that there are grounds for a, renew, a renewal of yeah. the traditional Atlantic links. 
Oh, I do too. I mean, I share that belief passionately. I, I certainly can't, as you said, speak for Vice President Biden on this issue, but I think in many of the things that he said, and even more importantly, you know, everything he stood for in his more than four decades in public service, he's attached very high priority to a strong transatlantic partnership and a strong transatlantic alliance. Now, obviously, given everything else that we've been discussing today, that alliance is going to have to shift. I mean, the reality is we've been having political nervous breakdowns on both sides of the Atlantic in recent years. On both sides of the Atlantic, there's a huge and immediate challenge of domestic renewal. The European Union as an institution faces a lot of those challenges, especially post-Brexit um, as well. So, so we both have to understand the significance of domestic renewal. Um, but I think the transatlantic relationship, and I don't say this out of naivete, um, I think it's going to be as important as ever as you look out into that world that we've been discussing, even with the increasing attention that the United States pays to China and to Asia. Partnership with, Euro with Europe is going to be enormously important. But like any other alliance, it's going to have to evolve as well. From the point of view of Washington, I think, um, it's going to be important to actually encourage some things that we've been a little skeptical about in the past, like the European Union focusing more on its security identity. So that we're focused, of course, on the importance of NATO and its health and vibrancy, but also on ways in which we can strengthen partnership with the European Union. So that Americans, I think, in what sometimes seems like an unnatural act at Washington, mm. are gonna to need to listen a little bit more. But at the same time, I think you'll see Americans if there's a new administration, expecting more as well out of European partners. And here I don't, I'm not talking just about issues like defense spending or security cooperations, as important as they are, but also a greater willingness to take initiative, um, you know, than, than has sometimes been the case in the past and to act resolutely on the international landscape. That's something that Americans have you know, rhetorically encouraged sometimes in the past, but been a little bit uncomfortable about in our, you know, characteristic paternalistic view of the relationship. And so we're going to have to be more flexible too. So it'll be, um, it seems to me anyway, an alliance that is as important as ever on this new international landscape, but it'll be different as well mm -hmm. in terms of the, um, the, the kind of rebalancing that needs to take place across the Atlantic. Bill, thank you very much. We'll move into the Q&A session now. And uh, I have a question from Peter Gunning, who is a member of the Institute, former ambassador of Ireland to various countries. Peter greatly enjoyed your book, by the way. Um, but he, he, he notes that at the back of it, there is a memo from 2008 on regaining, regaining the strategic initiative on Iran, uh, including uh, the possibility of opening some kind of office in, in, in Tehran. So t 12 years on, how do you see the situation in Iran? And are there any prospects at this juncture for diplomatic engagement. And I suppose I would uh, hang on to that as well, Bill, your, your take on, the, on the, the receding nuclear deal on, on the JCPOA. I mean, I think it was a foolish mistake for President Trump a couple of years ago to pull the United States out of the JCPOA, the Comprehensive Nuclear Agreement. Um, with Iran, which, as you well know, was not just a bilateral arrangement between the United States and Iran, but involved um, many of the world's major powers as well. Um, <clears throat> was it a perfect agreement? Well, of course not. You know, as you know, perfect is rarely on the menu in diplomacy. It was the best, in my view, the best of the available alternatives for preventing Iran from developing a nuclear weapon by means short of war. And Lord knows the Middle East has had more than its share of military conflicts. <clears throat> it was meant to be the beginning of diplomacy, not the end of it, in the sense that had you had a different administration elected in Washington in 2016, you would have seen an effort to build on that nuclear agreement to address issues like the timelines that were laid out in that agreement to address you know, remaining significant tensions between the United States and Iran and Iran and the international community over ballistic missile development, over efforts to disrupt and undermine other states in the Middle East. But what that requires is hard-nosed diplomacy. And instead, what we've seen, I think, under the guise of the so-called maximum pressure strategy <clears throat> has been a form of coercive diplomacy that's all coercion and no diplomacy. Um, a diplomacy that's tethered to unrealistic aims, to the assumption that 
this Iranian regime is going to either capitulate and run up the white flag and say that, you know, we're going to become like Sweden, or it's going to collapse or implode. And I don't think, I don't need anyone to persuade me of the depth of problems that we in the United States have had with this Iranian regime over more than 40 years, and that we continue to have. But I think that kind of hard-nosed diplomacy engagement and working with allies and partners around the world which was embodied in the approach to the nuclear negotiations is a far more effective way of dealing with those threats and risks and challenges than you know, what we've seen on offer in this administration over the last four years. And I do worry about the dangers of collisions, even as we look at the rest of 2020. You know, when you have hardliners, in a sense, in, in both Tehran and Washington, posed combatively at the foot of a very shaky escalatory ladder, yeah. Um, Bill, there's a question in a way which touches on what, what we've just been discussing, a question from Majid Golpour, who's a senior policy advisor at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Um, and Majid asked really whether the strategic differences between the EU and US at present on the JCPOA and on what to do next, whether that has to do with a divergence of interests or simply a divergence of analysis. I mean, in a sense, you, you, you've touched on it, but if you could, could take that up and, and maybe give us your thoughts on what the next stage will have to be. Well, I think it's, I think just to answer the question directly, I think it's a divergence, at least in the current US administration, in both analysis and, and interests in a lot of ways. I don't think that that's um, a lethal combination in the sense, as we demonstrated in the comprehensive nuclear negotiations, even though we're not always going to see eye to eye on every aspect of dealing with Iran, <clears throat> I think it's possible to resuscitate um, a broadly um, shared sense of purpose. On the nuclear issue, a lot's going to depend on what's left. You know, if you have a new administration elected, what's left of the, of the nuclear agreement. Um, Vice President Biden, for example, has indicated publicly that he would seek to resume American participation in the nuclear agreement if Iran was uh, living up to its obligations as well. And then I think the challenge would be to simultaneously um, enter into a set of negotiations on all of those other challenges that separate Iran from much of the rest of the world, whether it's in ballistic missile development, in, in attempting to end you know, catastrophic conflicts like the war in Yemen today, for which, um, you know, Iran, not alone, but Iran, along with Saudi Arabia and some of our uh, countries in the Gulf, um, share a responsibility. Um, but that not, ought not to be an impossible task for diplomacy either. So a lot depends on what the inheritance is, on, on uh, you know, what, what, if anything, is left of a nuclear agreement. Mm -hmm. But I think that broad approach would reveal, you know, a, if not an identical set of interests between the United States and Europe, at least a broadly shared sense of purpose on those issues. Bill, I have a question here, uh, which in a way goes back to uh, our discussion a moment ago about, um, uh, about the need for the US to, to reinvest in, 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 in partnerships uh, uh, and alliances. So this it, it, it touches on, this goes back to the recent announcement that um, Secretary of State uh, Pompeo and Borrell, I think, will be engaging in a, in a transatlantic dialogue on China, um, uh, which will begin shortly. I suppose that in, in principle that is something to be welcomed, um, uh, but uh, because both even the US and the EU fear a, a loss of competitiveness vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, I suppose that, that that is at the base of it and they want to establish shared values or, or recognize shared values. But do you think that that particular initiative ha has much prospect of success? Uh, in other words, an EU-US front in relation to China? Well, I think it's a very healthy instinct to begin that dialogue between the EU high rep and, and Secretary of State Pompeo. I think there's a lot to be gained um, through an honest discussion of such a complex issue as China's rise and the challenges it poses to both of us on either side of the Atlantic. Um, I think you have to be realistic about it. As I said before, there are gonna be areas in which we differ and um, how we approach those challenges. But I think, you know, you've seen 
on the continent of Europe, as well as in the recent decision the UK government has announced about 5G and Huawei, you know, an increasing concern in Europe, not as a favor to the United States or the Trump administration, but out of its own self-interest and concern about its, you know, most sensitive technologies as well. Um, so that I, I think it's, it's possible, notwithstanding some significant tactical differences, to build and coordinate, I think, an approach that's much more complementary than it is today. I think the same is true with regard to deeply important human rights issues. For example, in Hong Kong, given you know, recent steps by Xi Jinping and the Chinese leadership as well, um, you know, that's an area as well where given the affinity of values across the Atlantic, I think it's very important for us to coordinate and speak with as strong and as consistent a voice as, as we possibly can. That's what's going to have the most impact on the behavior of this Chinese leadership, I think. You know, yeah. Xi Jinping, as he looks at the world, I think sees a, a, you know, a kind of target-rich environment of opportunities created by fishers, whether it's in the transatlantic relationship or in America's relationships with partners and allies in Asia as well. Um, but a question from Mary Cross, who is a member of the Institute, a board member, uh, and a former colleague, a former senior Irish diplomat. Uh, Mary asks, um, is, is Eastern Ukraine going to become just another frozen conflict, uh, or uh, is there any chance of an advance in the Minsk process? What's your take on that? Well, I hate to be a pessimist on that issue in the short run because I think it's it's absolutely in the interests of Europe as well as the United States to do everything we can to support a healthy, sovereign Ukraine. Um, I, I worry that from Putin's point of view, again, as you know from your own experience in Moscow, if first prize from his point of view was a deferential government in Kyiv, second prize is a dysfunctional Ukraine. And I think that's what he's tried to do in eastern Ukraine following the annexation of Crimea is to create leverage that plays on the dysfunctions um, you know, within Ukrainian society as well. So I don't think he's in any rush uh, to try to resolve that situation. That is not an argument against continuing and trying to renew the Minsk process. It's not an argument against the United States and a new administration being much more actively engaged in that effort. I think this is a case where the United States and Europe need to work very closely together if we're going to have any impact on Putin's calculations. But uh, I think from his point of view, you know, he's a past master at frozen conflicts and manipulating other societies. And, and uh, I think that's what he's bent upon doing right now. Hmm. Um, I have a question, Bill, in relation to uh, uh, the future of multilateralism. Uh, obviously, uh, there are concerns about this against the background of pop rising populism and, and, and uh, nationalism in, 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 in various parts of the world. The COVID crisis, uh, that the case for multilateral action for collective decision making is, is stronger than ever. Um, What's your own view of that? Uh, did, I mean, the book does make a strong case for a renewal of multilateralism, um, but uh, and is one that, to which we in Ireland would be very sympathetic. But overall, um, can you see again a future U.S. administration immediately taking up the uh, immediately um, jo jo joining the forces on that? Yeah, no, I think you would see a very strong instinct if you have a new administration um, in terms of working with our key allies, especially in Europe, to develop what is in effect a new multilateralism. In other words, which recognizes that there are a number of international institutions, including in the UN system, which are deeply in need of reform. I just think it's a colossal mistake for the United States and this administration, as it looks, for example, at the World Health Organization, mm. to in effect take its marbles and go home and suspend participation in the WHO at a moment when you have a raging fire in the COVID pandemic, um, you know, running out of control around the world, especially in my own society as well. That's not the time when you try to reform the fire brigade. But we are gonna need, I think, to try to work together if there's a new administration, I think the United States and Europe, uh, to try to reform some of those institutions and work with others.
but also look at less formal coalitions of countries. I mean, that's that's been part the challenge of climate change. I'm sure if you have a new administration, it'll move immediately to rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement, but progress is going to depend on how you build on that as well. Same is going to be true in kind of managing, maximizing the benefits of the revolution in technology and minimizing the dislocations. Here again, you're not likely to see some overarching UN convention that's going to set out the rules of the road, given the differences between authoritarian leaderships like China and Russia and those of us in more open and democratic systems. But I do think that you can, notwithstanding all the differences across the Atlantic on some of those technology issues, on regulation, on the geopolitics of data, it's possible to bridge a lot of those differences, I think, and begin to develop a, more of a shared sense of purpose um, through those kind of coalitions of the willing, in a sense. And that's how you begin to shape those new rules of the road, I think, in technology, um, rather than through one overarching international yeah. institution anytime soon. So it'll be, I think, a kind of that new multilateralism will be a patchwork of reformed <clears throat> international institutions, in some cases, new institutions emerging that reflect the realities of the 21st century. Um, but, you know, also those uh, informal coalitions of countries, especially transatlantically, that share a broad sense of purpose and of values as well. And Bill, could you see a reform of UN institutions extending to the Security Council? I mean, this has been a, a long-standing theme, but, uh, you know, the Security Council arguably is one of the uh, institutions which most needs updating in terms of uh, breadth of membership and also procedures and visuals and so on. Uh, uh, I'm sure you've been asked this question many times before, yeah. but do you, do you see much prospect for movement in, uh, on Security Council reform? I think, yeah, again, you know the United Nations system and the Security Council far better than I do, Dave, but I, I think the short answer is yes. Um, like any other institution, the UN Security Council is going to have to evolve, including the issue of permanent membership. The United States has kind of incrementally pointed in that direction in our own policies by providing, you know, support for the, the possibility of Japanese permanent membership in the Security Council, as well as most recently India, always emphasizing, you know, those changes in permanent membership in the context of a reformed Security Council so that you're making other changes that, you know, open it up to uh, changing power realities in the world and hopefully make it a, and a once again, even though oftentimes this has been a rarity in the history of the Security Council, an effective institution. Right now, again, as you know very well, it's paralyzed by conflict between major powers. Now, the dirty little secret over the years is that while many of the current permanent members talk about their support for changing membership, deep down, many, if not all of them, are quite content with, you know, the, the limits to permanent membership now. So it would take um, you know, a real diplomatic effort, I think, to make progress in that direction. But it's going to be essential, I think, if the United Nations is going to regain the role that it needs to play, I think, in a variety of areas. But so much of that, again, as you know from your own experience in New York, depends on uh, the role of major powers. Yeah. Um, I have a question from Michael Sanfi, who's a first secretary with the Department of Foreign Affairs here in Dublin, uh, Bill, uh, who, who notes that there has been increase in the uh, in, in left-wing protest activity uh, uh, recently in the U.S., I mean, do, do you see that becoming a significant factor in terms of future foreign policy development, or is it is it just a transient moment linked perhaps to Black Lives Matter? No, I don't think there's anything transient about the challenges we face at home today, whether it's systemic racism, whether it's you know various forms of inequalities, whether it's of income or of opportunity, I think. One of the deep lessons of the COVID pandemic is the way in which it's accelerated and exposed a lot of those domestic dysfunctions and fissures alongside political polarization, um, which has made it very, very difficult to uh, recover an art of compromise in American politics um, as well. None of that is going to go away anytime soon, but I'm encouraged by the fact that not just through you know, widespread demonstrations over Black Lives Matter and people's understandable um, depth of frustration and anger and concern over the need for reform, finally, 
um, in our own society. I'm encouraged by the way in which Americans seem to be recognizing the need for fundamental reforms in those areas and in a way which you know, has tended to be episodic in the past. There was a great wave more than a half century ago in the 1960s of civil rights reforms. Um, and, and I can only hope that in, in that broad area of encouraging inclusive economic growth at a time when we need to focus much more on climate and clean and renewable energy um, technologies as well, that we'll be able to focus on racial injustice and a variety of you know, the challenges and self-inflicted wounds in our own society. Um, you know, which have crippled us uh, in a lot of ways. I think to come back to my point about self-repair at the beginning, mm. I still think there is that capacity in American society. But what we've been reminded of in recent years is that it takes good, courageous leadership to pull that off, not the sort that, you know, we're enjoying today. Yes, indeed. But I think we've time for two more questions. Uh, one, one relates to... Um, uh, I suppose emerging powers. Uh, which are the powers? Which are the emerging powers uh, that the U.S. that a future U.S. administration should focus on? Uh, I mean, you, obviously we, we we've dealt with China and Russia in in their particular context, but more generally, India is is an obvious partner of great economic and political weight in the world. But would you like to say, give us your thoughts about who the next administration should be looking to, to, to deepen its uh, alliances? Well, I mean, I think there are a range of parts of the world that historically suffer from benign or not so benign neglect in, in American foreign policy. India has not been one of them. I mean, there, there has been um, a rare kind of bipartisan support over the last 20 years or more in the United States for an increasingly strong U.S.-Indian partnership as India rises. Um, and I think that will be true um, if there's a new administration as well, not only because of the concerns about China that we were talking about before, but just as India's economic growth continues um, and as it wrestles with some very deep uh, political challenges at home, especially the, you know, the temptation toward Hindu majoritarianism in recent years, which I think you know, can do damage to Indian democracy as well. But I think that relationship is going to be an increasingly important one. Um, I think Southeast Asia is another area where we saw, particularly in the Obama administration, a lot of focus there. And I think that's going to continue to be a focus. Africa is an area, a part of the world that's, again, as you know very well, going to be hugely important um, yeah. for demographic reasons, among many others, as the population of Africa doubles. Um, by the middle of the century from a billion to probably about two billion people. So its significance is going to grow. And finally, I'd say, you know, Americans often neglect the reality that our strategic home base, in a sense, ought to be in North America. And here in the Trump administration, we've accomplished the rare diplomatic feat of alienating the Canadians. So I think, I think it's, it's important for us also to look closer to home at countries, whether it's Canada or Mexico, that matter enormously to the American economy and the health of our society. That's very interesting. On, on Africa, Bill, in fact, we, we, we have given priority in, in terms of Irish foreign policy to Africa in recent years. And we've pushed uh, at EU level for a much stronger EU commitment there. It, uh, it, it's clearly, it, it, it's perhaps the major partner for the European Union over the, over the, the coming years. And uh, so I relate very much to what you said. Bill, the last question um, really relates to how diplomacy is conducted nowadays, uh, or right now, in fact, um, in, in the COVID context. I mean, we, we have denied ourselves the, the armchair, but um, in a way, um, it would be interesting to have your reflections on, on, on whether digital diplomacy is, is the way that we, we will increasingly have to go in future, um, because meetings are... Uh, no longer are possible physically, um, and, and how will that change the, uh, the nature of diplomacy, which after all relies heavily on um, personal contact, pers mediation, whispers in the corridor, etc. I mean, it's something which exercises us quite a bit, and, and uh, it'll be very interesting to have your, your uh, sense of what um, the future may hold for, for, for new approaches to diplomacy? 
Well, it's a really important question. And I think there's, there's no question but that um, digital, digital diplomacy, virtual connections between diplomats and between foreign ministries are gonna become more and more important, not just through the pandemic era, but in the years and decades beyond that. So the mix I think, is, inevitably, is inevitably gonna shift. Um, I don't think that, however, is a substitute for what you just rightly emphasized, and mm -hmm. that's the importance of human interactions, because that's what diplomacy is at its core. It's a business of human interactions, and it's the work that gets done, as you said, in the corridors, on the margins of formal meetings that can build trust and relationships and create opportunities for making diplomatic progress. So it's gonna be a mix and it'll be a challenge, I think, for the next generation of, of diplomats to find the right balance between those. But I, I, I don't think you're ever gonna be able to move away from the significance of those face-to-face -face human interactions, however constrained they may be, especially in the pandemic era. Bill, thank you so much for giving so generously of your time uh, uh, this morning in your case. Um, uh, we really appreciate it. And I have to say uh, uh, to those who haven't, to those in the audience who haven't read Bill's book, I, I can only warmly commend it. I think it's not only a fascinating sort of tour d'horizon of what you have achieved, what America has achieved over the last 40 years or so, but it is uh, it's full of brilliant insights and it's witty. It is also extremely well written uh, and uh, I personally enjoyed it immensely. Um, Bill, we're, we're delighted to have you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure the industry would love to uh, have you again in future, uh, whether virtually or um, uh, um, physically. Uh, and we look forward to that very much. You, you, we benefited greatly from what you told us about a range of topics. There wasn't really enough time to go into the vast uh, uh, array of issues on which your book touches, but I think we managed to hit one or two at the same time. Um, thank you very much indeed for being with us today, Bill. It's a great pleasure. Thanks so much.